Well, hello, and uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be able to uh, let me uh, uh, share some information about our research center with you. I'm sorry I can't be there today. Um, my name is Jason Roundtree. Again, I'm an associate faculty member uh, in animal science, uh, where a majority of our work is done at Lake City Research Center. Uh, we've been working uh, on, on grazing systems for about the last 10 to 11 years, and I'd like to just share some, some data with you guys, kind of give you the ethos of our approach, and also uh, maybe share a few thoughts on, on where I think we're headed. I'm certainly excited to be able to also engage uh, Paul and John on this. And so I'll go to my slides here and, and just really kind of want to briefly, as many of you know and read the news and whatever, you, you see that there's just always this epic debate, right? Like there's these challenges of do cattle help or hurt the environment? And even when you start looking at it in the scientific world, there's not consensus. For instance, I can go to the literature and we use what's called holistic plan grazing, a methodology that's, that's based on, on trying to graze in a way that's improving the environment. And you can go to the science and find some people suggest that uh, holistic plan grazing doesn't do much, that we should just throw the cattle out and, and, and really lowly manage them. Um, there's also people that would argue that enteric methane is a key contributor to climate. Uh, change and therefore reducing livestock dramatically will improve society. And finally, um, as we know this concept of, of grazing livestock and soil carbon and the potential maybe to offset some CO2 emissions through grazing, um, even if we can do those things, people would suggest in the literature and science that it isn't a long-term possibility. Um, but concurrently, I can also go to the literature and find papers that support the opportunities of planned grazing and animals' positive impacts on land, that indeed grazing does sequester significant carbon. Um, I can find papers uh, out there, plus from our laboratory at Michigan State, that would suggest that methane is kind of down the line when looking at emissions in a beef cattle model, a grazing model specifically. And finally, that we've lost so much carbon because of, of poor agricultural management, that indeed there's a great opportunity to use regenerative agriculture to regenerate that carbon from the atmosphere and put it back into the soil. As you're learning uh, in this school about managed grazing, we use in the literature a term called adaptive multi-paddock grazing, which effectively is kind of an overarching term for uh, planning uh, your grazing. Um, you know, we've got John and, and on here who's, who's we've worked with for a long time that's been applying this. And, and what we found through this management protocol at Lake City is that we actually see greater cattle productivity by our management. Uh, we hypothesize this is the fact that we can typically see grasses in a more vegetative way and therefore they're, they're more nutritious and the cattle can perform well. Um, we have to acknowledge that in any grazing system there is methane that goes off. Um, we also have more and more information and science to support the fact that as we manage this way we begin to see greater plant productivity from a standpoint of more leaf area, but likewise those roots, uh, those plants roots are putting down deeper, they're broader, and what this does then is it reduces soil erosion and it's also increasing microbial activity in the soil. Because of those things we're seeing greater soil carbon sequestration. This has to do somewhat from the, the litter and the, and, the, and the root turn, or the litter and the, the, the plant uh, being incorporated into the ground, but, but more so based on what's going on below ground. The, the greater microbial activity, uh, the greater um, processing of materials into carbon that's bound to mineral. And the thing I also want to point out is that it's really predicated on, on a recovery period and allowing plants uh, to fully recover, which for us means we don't want a, a plant to be grazed more than, than uh, once over a three-day period. So we at maximum allow animals to graze plants for around three days and then we want to allow for those plants to come into a full recovery. Um, so the first study I would like to share with you is a uh, study that we did that was published in Agriculture Systems that actually looked at um, our on-farm uh, grass-fed model. Uh, we measured uh, emissions, we uh, looked at carcass weights, and what we decided to do was to take this and compare it to a grain-fed scenario. Um, I don't really have a contention on grain versus grass, but we use that as a contrast. We also incorporated uh, five years of soil carbon sequestration into this model to look at the potential for offsets uh, in our grass finishing system. And just quickly, what we found is that when we looked at all the emissions, meaning all the greenhouse gases going up 
from that system. Uh, we found that many is others that a feedlot finishing system is, is pretty efficient. Um, it's, it's more efficient than a, an adaptive multi paddock or our grass finishing system by about 30 to 40%. But what I also want to share is when you go to the literature, when we compared our grazing system to continuous set stock grazing, we found that our emissions were 45% lower than what has originally been reported in the literature. Uh, we had considerably shorter grass finishing times for the beef. Uh, in fact, relative to some papers, six to eight months shorter. We hypothesize this is due to our greater forage quality and our pasture fertilization. And so just to think about this in a figurative way, uh, here's the different emissions. And again, we're thinking about the enteric methane uh, emissions from feed and manure that are going up. The adaptive multi paddock on the left, a feedlot on the right. Um, the greatest footprint is the methane. Uh, in a, typically in a grain fed scenario, it's gonna be more of the feed emissions. But you can see that 30 or so percent decrease in the feedlot. But here's something that's really interesting I wanna show you. So if I look at that footprint and I don't incorporate the changes in soil carbon, this is what those numbers look like on a kilogram of beef from an emission perspective. If I incorporate soil carbon sequestration in the model, our actual grass finishing system became a net sink to the environment. And so importantly, it's, it's, it's good to understand that through proper management, we may be able to even manage our cattle uh, and produce beef while supplying a net sink of, of carbon back into the soil through our management system. Now, nothing's perfect and nothing's easy in these systems. And for instance, in this situation, it takes considerably more land to have a grass finishing model as compared to a grain model. In fact, it can take two to two and a half times the amount of land. And that's something that's really important to understand. And so at the end of the day, we found that our grazing at Lake City actually has been a sink to the environment. Um, if we were to incorporate the cow footprint, that would be less of a benefit just to the grass finishing. But regardless, we know that what we're doing is building soil carbon in that system. It's important though, when you think about this big picture that you understand the differences in land use. Um, and we do, however, hypothesize and summarize without question that grazed cattle do definitely have a role to play in sustainable food systems. The other thing that we talked about earlier is what is the impact of methane? This is from a brand new paper uh, that we had published in Applied Animal, uh, or Applied uh, yeah, Animal Ag Systems. And um, what I want to say is that methane for a very long period of time has been a natural cycle, a natural system with grazing animals uh, and, and the ecological environments they're in, going back to bison or uh, many other natural migrating ruminants that are out there. And so it's important to understand that when cattle graze, they uh, process forages and those forages uh, are, uh, are used for nutrients for, for, for production. But likewise, we do see methane coming up and it is eructated out into the environment. When you hear the term car cow farts or all some of those things out of, out of other areas, it's important to understand that 98% of the methane emitted is through the mouth and only a couple percent through the back end. Um, but it's important to understand though that when cattle bring methane up into the environment, it is broken down in about a 10 to 12 year window uh, by um, uh, OH radicals. And so it's effectively, what happens is, is that this CH4 is broken down into water and carbon dioxide, which is then used in terms of rain events and to regenerate in terms of photosynthesis. And so often we have situations where cattle are just blamed for all these problems in the environment. But it's important to understand that methane has been a natural, uh, very long ongoing system and nature has found a way to balance that out. And so it's important to understand that when people begin to really get on beef cattle and dairy cattle based on the standpoint of methane. Um, this is the way that we measure methane. This is actually a green feed monitoring system where a cow can actually come in and we actually bait uh, some, some pellets. She comes in and grazes, eats these pellets in this hopper and we can actually measure the amount of methane that's going into that system. And so we've been doing this for a very long number of years now. And um, it's important to understand that most of our data would suggest that based on the normal predictive equations used to look at cattle's impact, we've actually found that our cattle have normally 15 up to even in some situations, 30% less methane 
than what the textbooks say they should. And it goes back to management again. And so I think it's important to understand that, that methane is a natural part of the system. It isn't something that, that we should believe is, is destroying the earth through, through climate. And, and now methane from other sources can certainly be more problematic. But I think when you talk about methane in the context of ecology, uh, it's certainly not the problem that many people make it out to be. Now, the last couple of things I'd like to show with you is some data that we've been working on. We've almost got this paper accepted, so I feel good about sharing it with you. Uh, a paper that I've done working with white oak pastures in Georgia on looking at the impacts of management, again, on ecosystem services. So in 1993, this is what white oak pastures looked like. It was a, a crop farm, highly eroded. And what um, the manager began to do, the landowner, is he began to bring in cattle. He began and hogs and poultry and create this stacked enterprise model um, to begin to regenerate the land. Uh, so he's using managed grazing, he uses compost, he brings hay onto the farm to feed it. Um, but it's really a neat success story showing the impacts of animal science on improved land. And so what we did is we went in uh, working with General Mills, a, a company called Qantas, and we, we sampled across the transition time. So we did what's called a chrono sequence. You're zero, five, 10, 15, and 20. So this was all done at one time. So effectively, what we did is we went into some areas that have been managed regeneratively just for a couple years, all the way up to 20 years, if that makes sense. And so what we found is that over that entire period of time through this chrono sequence is that the manager was enjoying about a 2.3 metric ton of carbon sequestration per year. When we looked at different soil health parameters across that time, water stable aggregate, microbial respiration, uh, active carbon, uh, and, and soil protein, we found that every year that he managed, those numbers went up. Interestingly, we didn't see as, as solid of a water holding capacity as I would have thought, but the point being is that through this period of time, we saw dramatic and positive improvements in soil health and soil carbon sequestration. Another thing I, I would like to kind of begin to finish up with here is the aspect of soil carbon stabilization. Uh, many people think that carbon sequesters very quickly, and this is some brand new work in nature, looking at the impacts of, of soil carbon saturation in organic matter. And what I want you to understand is this is blue is grasslands, um, red is forests, and this is what we call mineral associated organic matter, or the carbon bound to mineral that's very stable in the soil. And what this was done over thousands of samples uh, from Europe, and what the scientists showed is that there can be saturation of carbon, but it happens at very high amounts, such that only at about 10 to 12 percent organic matter do we actually begin to see the saturation of carbon in the soil. If we look at particulate organic matter, which is that bigger aggregate that we see in the soil, there's absolutely no saturation whatsoever. So what this says is that we should manage and can consider the management of regenerative agriculture and its ability to potentially offset carbon emissions as a long-term goal and a long-term solution, I think, to, to helping um, mitigate climate. And so just some top-end opportunities, another paper in Nature written by Keith Postian, that he um, summarizes that through a combination of crops, grasslands, management, plus technology, that if we look at the opportunities of agriculture over time, we have a really keen opportunity to be able to use regenerative agriculture um, to offset CO2 emissions. And I think that's something very important to document um, as we move forward. And so what does that look like? How do we do this and how do we see this come to fruition? Well, that's what we're working on here is what type of monitoring and calibration can we generate to begin to understand what's happening with water, with carbon, with biodiversity, and to be able to, to do hardcore measurements at the ground level, but also link this stuff into remote sensing. And that's kind of where we're headed at Lake City, uh, working on the aspects of, of measuring metrics and monitoring, and being able to generate opportunities to understand what's happening at the ground, linking it up to space, but then likewise using algorithms that are predictive of soil carbon, water infiltration, and then bring that back to, to a farmer's hands through technology. And so that's really where I see this headed. Um, and, and so I think there's some unique opportunities that are out there 
Uh, there's some new opportunities through ecosystem service markets, through Indigo Ag and others that are looking at these opportunities. And so um, with that, uh, I want you to be aware that while we talk a lot about carbon, it is only one metric. Um, biodiversity, water, animal productivity, there's a lot of things out there we need to keep in mind of. Um, I do believe that the change can happen and happen soon. Um, I think that we're going to have to see these markets evolve over time to where they are uh, going to uh, more aptly uh, monetize the farmer and rancher as these things go on. Uh, and I think it's important, though, that we need to be really working to address how can we adopt agriculture management that is going to help in terms of, of climate, but likewise be profitable in the process. So with that, I'll uh, stop and, and you know, we, can, we can begin to have a discussion. Thank you.